people might have uh, very strong liberals and strong conservatives seated together. And at that table, there would be a lot of disagreement. So we're interested in this kind of disagreement on sort of fundamental political, ideological, some sort of political ideological dimension. Um, and so what we would like to do is to be able to observe everybody's ideology. And in political science, we call that everybody's ideological ideal point. Sort of where do they place themselves on a liberal to conservative scale. Uh, and if we could observe everybody's ideological ideal point, then measuring disagreement for us would be very easy because then we could just take some measure of the dispersion of ideological ideal points at every table. And so, so at the table where everybody's liberal, the, dis the dispersion would be very low. So you could think of it as like taking the standard deviation of sort of people's ideological ideal points, and that standard deviation would, would be very low. And then at the table where you had extreme liberals and extreme conservatives seated at the, that table, the standard deviation of ideal points for that table would be very high. So we could measure, you know, what we'd like to do is to be able to measure the dispersion of people's ideological ideal points at every table. <clears throat> it's important, I'm stopping, because that's, that's important. That's, is that pretty obvious? Is that easy to understand? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. In, in this case, we do. That's correct. We, we don't need to, because if we had, uh, it turns out in America, there's a long literature in political science on ideology in American politics is currently unidimensional. It hasn't always been that way. But this, the method would not exclude uh, a multidimensional uh, a conception of ideology if you had the right measures to be able to, to um, pin down the, the multiple dimensions. Okay, but we do. We assume it's... Um, so the problem is that we don't observe people's ideological ideal points. Instead, the best we can do is make an inference about what people's ideology is. Um, and to, just to, to show you what, what that looks like, uh, what we do is we have these, we have a set of items in the pretest survey um, that are all what we call indicators of people's ideology. And we make, take, make use of the, the set of five indicators uh, in what's called an item response theory model uh, to make an inference about uh, what people's ideology is based on the set of items. And so the way an item response theory model works, let me make sure I'm not skipping anything. Yeah, we take these five items right here, and we crank them through an ideal point estimator, uh, which is, again, just a, a simple uh, item response theory model. So we take these five items, and how people responded in the pretest survey to these five items to make an inference about what their ideal point is. Okay? And then we take their ideal point, you know, these estimated ideal points for everybody in the sample, and then look at, well, what's the dispersion of ideal points at every table based on these estimates. So you could imagine, if you had the, knew the ideal point of everybody, then you could take the standard deviation of the ideal points of everybody at the table. We actually do it, we, we get rid of the person that, you know, the, the ith person, we take, take their ideal point out and take the standard deviation of everybody else at the table. Okay, um, and so you, you could imagine uh, calculating our, our ideal measure of disagreement uh, if we knew everybody's ideal point, right? And you could imagine then, if you could observe at this true level, if you could observe everybody's true ideological ideal point, you could then construct the true level of disagreement at every table based on uh, how we've defined it. And then you could imagine doing a regression in Stata, for example, if you use Stata, where you would you know generate, uh, uh, take the ideal points of everybody in a sample and use you know, your status skills to generate a variable that's the level, the, you know, the standard deviation of everybody's ideal point at everybody's table. And that would be your measure of disagreement. And then you could use stata again to square that variable. So you'd have disagreement and disagreement squared. And then you could just run a regression with, you put in disagreement and disagreement squared into your regression. And that would test for the nonlinear effect of uh, deliver, of disagreement on whatever outcomes that you're measuring, right? So you, you know how to do that kind of put a first and second order uh, variable in the model. So that's what we like to do, but the problem is that because this ideal point is an inference, that means that uh, the, any function of ideal points is itself an inference. And so there's uncertainty, we have uncertainty in our measure of ideal points, and as a consequence we have uncertainty in our measure of disagreement. 
So that's the first, uh, and really the only problem I'm going to talk about. There's another one that I'm going to try to skip over. Uh, but this is the first uh, kind of problem with uh, when you have this stochastically measured treatment is that you have uncertainty in the level of treatment that everybody in your example got. And so what we do, the, we, we propose the solution to this is to use this kind of three-step dynamic model where uh, all this happens at the same time. So that what your model does is it measures everybody's ideal point as a distribution, making use of Bayesian item response theory models or latent variable models. And so what the model is doing at this stage is not just saying what's your point estimate of everybody's ideal point, but you're, you're, you're saying you're also finding well what's the full distribution of your inference of what the ideal point is based on the model based uncertainty. Okay, so, so everybody in your sample has a distribution for their ideal point. We then use those distributions to create a table level disagreement variable. Um, because disagreement in this case is itself a function of distributions. That means that disagreement itself, our measure of disagreement is a, a uh, distribution for everybody in the sample. Okay? And so, and so that we're correctly accounting for the degree of uncertainty we have about how we're measuring disagreement at this step. And then we take that uncertainty and prop it, propagate it through the model to make sure that all of the model parameters are correctly accounting for the amount of uncertainty we have in our inference about the level of disagreement at every table. So you can, it's, it might be easier to picture what this looks like by uh, looking at uh, this diagram. So this diagram, what we've done is we've taken, just randomly selected 100 participants. And so we ran the model and we collected that, that distribution of uh, disagreement for every individual in our sample. And we just selected 100 of them at random and plotted their distributions. So for each person, and we, you know, we rank ordered their, their medians in this diagram. And so what each of these vertical bars is represents a, the, there are, it, it represents a person. And the, the length of the vertical bar tells you how much uncertainty we have uh, about where their ideal point is actually, or I'm sorry, where their level of disagreement is actually located. Uh, this red line that snakes through here connects the medians of these distributions. And so where the red line intersects each black line would be, if you're familiar with factor analysis, that would be the equivalent of a, a, fact, a factor score, or a point estimate of how much of the level of disagreement that each person <coughs> observed. And so what people you know, oftentimes will do is they'll take that factor score you know, if you're working in Stata, you would take that factor score uh, as the, the point estimate prediction of what uh, their uh, level of disagreement is and just use that factor score as an independent variable. But doing that doesn't correctly account for the, the amount of uncertainty you have in your inference about how much disagreement everybody actually observed. And so what our model does is it takes Instead of entering a factor score or a point estimate for everybody, the model actually makes use of the full distribution for each person and then correctly propagates that uncertainty through the, the parameters of the model. Okay, and then, and then as a consequence, the inferences that we make are, are correct. They're correctly accounting for the amount of uncertainty we have in the estimate of the treatment. Now, uh, this I'm going to skip, if that's okay, with no loss of continuity. All right. Are we doing okay? I mean, can I, should I skip this? Um, skip it. You can if you... Okay, well, I'll just quickly, let me just quickly yes, say that, uh, uh, that the, so there's, so there's two, two things going on here. So one is that we have this degree of uncertainty in our inference of the level of disagreement that everybody observes. And the second problem is whenever you are trying to make an inference about the, the you know, the, in this case, the treatment variable, an important independent variable in your model, based on survey data, we know that there's always going to be some non-response to a, a survey. So in this case, 15% of our participants did not fill out their pretreatment survey, so we have no idea what their ideal point was uh, when they came to the study. Um, and so there's no, and there's no way to kind of impute that because we don't have any pretreatment data for them to make an imputation of what it would have been had they been forced to fill out the survey. And so whenever, and so, so this is just sort of a second kind of methodological point 
I'm going to say before I go on to the models and results is whenever you're in this situation and you're trying to make it, you know, 